Oh, it is the Lieutenant Governor uh, Delbert Holzman. Good morning, sir. Uh, good morning, Paul. Yeah. How are you, man? I'm, I'm good. How are you, sir? Yeah, it's good to see you. I just, I yep. just hope they don't outlaw grits, man. This is serious. <sighs> It has got, listen, <laughs> when you hear the president so of the wrong. United States of America as lieutenant governor, you've got, I mean. <laughs> I just, I can't help you, buddy. I just don't drink any more well, coffee I mean, this morning. It's it's to the point where, let's just say Columbus Air Base gets a little flooding, and his idea on solving that is the objective <laughs> of the entire military by changing the, why not just build a berm? Uh, you know? Why, know. why Put put a couple of French drains in, <laughs> but to solve the problem in Meridian or Columbus uh, or on wherever it happens to be by changing Earth's atmosphere yeah. is is a little bit of an indirect uh, part of that solution. I yeah, just, I know, and I don't know any of our, our bases that flood. And, and in fact, of course, we send oh. Keesler's uh, people into the middle of the hurricane. Yeah. So yeah. what? I don't know, Paul. It's just uh, I just it's need so to work on this. Yeah. Yes, uh, sir, it is. I, I worry about this because it's much like following uh, a car on the interstate, and they, ha- they have this two-wheel trailer, and they start to wobble. <laughs> yeah. and, and after a point, you realize that they're, they're not going to... It's not, not going to make it. <laughs> no. The centrifugal force <laughs> is going to turn that thing to plywood. Uh, well, I, whatever. Mississippi's in a lot better shape, Paul, I, oh, all I can tell you. Every single day, people ought to understand this, the home of faith, family, and, and flag. Yeah. Because we, I know it's even less here than it was many years ago, but still, we are far, far better off than a lot of these states. Your analysis. Hello, and, Paul. And, wanna, yeah. let, let me, let's just pick sure. at that. Talking about water. Paul, we have water. When you go past Dallas, they don't have any water. And they're talking about closing down parts of Arizona and, and the crops yep. and all of that yep. other stuff. We have water. We have lower-cost electricity than most anywhere else. We don't put salt on our roads here. We have a great climate. We have the greatest agriculture in the world. We grow more trees than we could ever cut. We've, we've added two forestry um, uh, mills in the last year. And our, our natural resources are outstanding. Uh, and so that's, that's why we're experiencing growth in uh, mm-hmm. the world's best aluminum factories being built. I was up there the other day in Columbus walking that. It's unbelievable to watch what they're doing there. Uh, you know, What's it's the fact? Two million the on fact? their feet. And, and we, we don't need to forget this asset, too, because we have the number one uh, 100% purest humidity. Which yeah. is great on the skin yeah. if it if it doesn't kill you. So. <laughs> you know, so. Well, we we are a little hotter than I would like to be. I have to give them credit for that. Every, it's every, as hot everybody as blazes is, here. Yeah, it's been that the, way. The I, what I, there are a lot of different things. I was going to do, but your overview of the election. Yeah, we. Um, well, it's a mixed. Uh, they asked me that the other mm-hmm. night, right after we were declared the the winner, and um, it was a mixture, really, Paul, of uh, relief. I think because it's you have so many people, Paul, at work for you. I mean, all over Mississippi, we had people calling and calling their neighbors, and we had young people working. Was one of them was in high school that would work when she got off uh, in one of the schools here. Others, just young people at Mississippi State, Ole Miss, some had graduated and whatnot. And then you have uh, just a phenomenal staff that I have on communications and, and, and Nathan Up Church is our chief of staff. But the, all of those people just work so hard, and you just don't want to let them down. And um, I felt a relief that we had not let them down, let's put it that way, by, by winning the seat again. And then the other is kind of when you look and you've been given this opportunity again to really shape Mississippi for the next four years, really for the next generations. And how are we going to go about doing that? I started on it yesterday. Uh, I had a ground. I mean, we got through celebrating, I guess, about one in the morning. But by nine o'clock, I was in Gluckstadt at a groundbreaking for their new police department that the legislature had funded. And then we started on our agenda for next year, which we included yesterday. We talked a long time about health care and how we would structure that. I probably... During the campaign, I guess I was probably in 12 or 15 hospitals uh, from New Albany to Brookhaven to Singing River, uh, all over Mississippi, at Greenwood, wherever. So we, we're, we're trying to come up with what we're going to do about health care, and I'm real excited to, to put that in. And, of course, campaign finance reform is, is high on my list and high on my senator. Yeah, I want to talk about the campaign, but let me backtrack on this one yeah. because you, you alerted to this. Uh, there was a uh, in the news media a story about uh, uh, one of the big hospitals. I think it was in Little Rock, 
that yeah. is uh, undergoing a lot of cuts. And, and right. uh, Arkansas, it was a not, not a Little Rock, I believe it was in Little Rock. And, and, and the, the reason that was spotlighted is because they have been, uh, it was quite a while ago, they went to Medicaid expansion. So it's right, one of the. Kind of a health insurance plan. Yeah. 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 Yep. And it, it's not working out there. It's not the sal- salvation of the hospitals. That's right. That's right. And, and people need to understand that. I, I know hospitals would love uh, the money, but is that the problem that's going to solve it? Uh, uh, absolutely not. And I, I've tried to be honest about that with everybody. We, mm-hmm. I have visited with, I say, a dozen. Uh, hospital CEOs, not one of them, and they're very competent, by the way. They're managing this cost. They're trying to manage these costs in the delivery of services and the nurses and all the other things that go on there, nurse shortages and stuff. But not one of them has said expansion is the cure. It's like putting more water in a leaky bucket, Paul. It's still going to leak. So we have other bigger issues, which include our pharmaceutical costs. This includes our mental health costs uh, for both young people. I've I visited with schools, and upon a talk, this teacher came up to me. We had a mm-hmm. forum of about maybe six or eight teachers in a room, and she said, I don't even recognize these kids anymore. They're they're so aggressive, and it's so hard to teach, and I'm not yep. trained to yep. deal with them. And there, there are a lot of aspects from mental health through uh, nurse shortage, and I mean from hospitals to pharmaceuticals. This onion has a lot of layers to it, Paul, and when we start this process of unwinding it, my ultimate goal is to have every county have a standard of care and a delivery of care for that county. So I don't know how that will evolve, most likely to an emergency room, internal medicine, OBGYN, that kind of thing, and then how do you stack that around here? Mm -hmm. And we have some aging facilities that, quite frankly, we're spending more to keep them up than, than would be to build a new one. So you're going to see, I think, some new construction in the healthcare industry to to address yep. that, and some location decisions. Can we can we do that without finally somehow managing to get to a definitive solution for the certificate of need? Well, I'm I'm not a big fan of the certificate of need, as as I, I've said before. I, mm-hmm. I I think it's outlived its usefulness, and I think we're at a process where we're going to need the economics of the world to to operate more clearly. Um, I think our hospitals, like for example in New Albany, they have turned one whole floor into an outpatient uh, provision. So that you come to the hospital yep. there and uh, you do your knee surgery or whatever you've had and whatever, and they, they send you back out that day. And so they have effectively joined in the competition with these outlying uh, doctor facilities to say, we'll just do it at the hospital, and it's just one day. So they're evolving into addressing some of those issues, Paul, and I, I think the CONs yep. are now counterproductive. Um, you know the the analogy I gave about the two wheel trailer going uh, out of kilter. I, I feel the same thing with these with the campaign uh, financing out there, the these PAC and things. And, and if we're going to leave the next generations better in politics in this state, yeah. should we should we do something in the next session with that? With, with one way or the other. With what part, Paul? I'm just talking about campaign finance, the, where we need to tighten well, it up. And if, it. if you if you stand in the door of the Capitol in January, you're going to get run over with campaign finance bills. I'm yep. just telling you. Uh, and I started well, on working on mine and having them ha- hang on because we got a break coming yep. up. Dra- having them trapped in the hopper is a lot different than what they wind up on the governor's desk. Well, I've talked to my senators, mm-hmm. and all I can tell you is it's coming out of the Senate. All right. Well, we'll we'll uh, we'll hold you to that one. All right, more. We'll talk about school choice and some other things when we come back with the Lieutenant Governor, Gilbert Hoseman. Philip Shamley, we'll talk to him, Executive Director, Mississippi Petroleum Marketers Association. Just one of the questions, why do convenience stores um, think putting chargers where the gas pumps are not a good idea? We'll talk about that and more coming up at uh, 8.05. Back with the Lieutenant Governor. If, if, and real quickly, because I've got so many other things to put in here, if we were doing what you think would be job one in any of the forthcoming bills that you alluded to as far as campaign finance reform, what do you think, what area would we solve that problem in? I mean, how would, uh, well, how would that be done? The first is we need to get somebody to enforce them. That's the number one. Right Boom. now we've yep. got like yep. uh, three different people that have some piece of the pie and then nobody's eating all of it. And I... So I'm very concerned about that. And second, this, and, and you know what happened to me and, and to my campaign. There were mm-hmm. $885,000 in 
dark secret money, maybe uh, illegal, maybe criminal, I, we don't know yet, that came in the last week of the campaign to run negative ads that you saw on TV saying that I, I killed 18 million babies and all that other stuff. Those were all dark money packs that was starting and started about July the 6th or July the 11th, I think, mm -hmm. in Washington one in Annapolis, I think, and they they were all funded by dark secret money that nobody knows where it came from, and then it was dropped on my opponent's campaign by his treasurer, who also ran the pack. So that that whole sordid uh, experience where people tried to steal your election, and Mississippians saw through it, thank goodness, but tried to come up and steal your election like that with last-minute contributions from you don't know who gave them the money. That's the well, biggest well, thing. Yeah. Not so well, much let me the ask amount. You this. Let, let's just say the same thing happened and in, in your campaign for you as mm -hmm. far as the Republicans concerned. Mm -hmm. And there was a dark money buy from a pact uh, that was running ads on this network that were absolutely outrageous to the point where you, as the candidate, felt that they were repugnant. Could you stop them? Well, I could not. Uh, because we can't, you're not supposed to talk to those people about what their ads are. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, only thing I wanted to make sure that, that if you said something, it was uh, about my opponent and had to do with his record or something like that, not something where you killed babies, you know, that kind of thing. But, for example, you didn't have a good record, which in my yeah. case, he didn't. Yeah. He didn't vote, you know, for a lot of things. Those but I guess what I'm asking is legally, things. legally, it would never come of the law. I can't, I can't. can't. No, I could not. And, uh, is that anything we can do on a state legislative basis to stop that? Well, that I think federal? the candidate himself or herself uh, needs to say, uh, I don't I don't believe that kind of thing. That's, that's false or whatever, oh, turn against yeah. their own. But, you know, what, what Paul, what this is about is the next election uh, because these people vaporize. Now, you can't find any of these packs anymore. They're all gone as of yesterday, probably. We couldn't find anybody. So the next election for governor or attorney general or secretary of state or whoever it happens to be, or maybe even a Senate uh, seat, uh, a local Senate seat, certainly the congressional Senate seats, those are going to have the same issue. And so it, this is not about like, well, what happened in this campaign? It's about what are we going to do about the future ones? And there's so, so much of this I call dark money where you can't find out where it came from. There's so much of this floating around Washington that they'll come drop darn near a million dollars in a lieutenant governor of Mississippi yeah. race. And quite frankly, I don't do anything with uh, international matters or <laughs> national matters. We just run the state. So it, I think I'm more concerned about the next election even mm -hmm. than I am this one. Um, have you heard from uh, of, of Chris McDaniel since the election? I mean, do, uh, the, the, in the concession speech, did you hear from him personally? No. Uh, I, I think he did say something about he would uh, be supporting the uh, GOP candidate during the the good. Uh, general election, uh, so that was good. Uh, let me move on to this as far as committees. Will there be any changes in the committees in if you are uh, elected for another term? Will be, will there be some changes as far as the committees are concerned? Will we will we address finally at least in the Senate under your purview uh, the number of committees? Yes, we're, we're, we'll be looking at those. I, I can't tell you how many will not be there or be there. Mm -hmm. uh, for a while, those committees were kind of appointed for um, to give everybody a chairmanship. And as you know, we had 45 committees and 36 Republicans, so the Democrats got some committee chairmen. But they didn't get any power, Paul, because I stacked every committee with more Republicans on it than there were Democrats. But, so there wasn't any way. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I didn't matter who the chairman was really much because if the chairman didn't bring it out in some instances, I'd move it to another committee run by a Republican and we'd bring it out. So there was no real, um, there was no real Democrat. That was just mistaken uh, advertising. Yeah, we had 13 Democrat chairmen, but they, they didn't have any power because the majority of the committee was already Republican. Mm -hmm. As to the committee structure itself, I think you're right. I, I want to look back at function versus uh, politics on that. So what, what are the major issues that we need to look at in Mississippi? Obviously, education is one we made great strides on. Senator DeBar did a wonderful job last year. Uh, education, infrastructure, this health care uh, really goes over my insurance committee, um, my public health committee, uh, my uh, appropriations committee. It touches a lot of different things. And so I really want to go back and look at what the function of 
uh, is necessary for us to operate government and may have the committee structure meet the functional structure. Maybe not so much. Uh, we gave everybody a chairmanship of uh, there's one like federal transfer of money or something's never met. I mean, there's some of them that just are just not worth even keeping. Yeah, I understand. What would a school choice bill look like under, uh, as, as far as it working its way through the Senate? I expect one this year. I haven't seen a draft. That really hasn't been a priority uh, for us to discuss. Uh, you know, we've had some discussions about a year ago about mm-hmm. that. But we expect some school choice uh, uh, bills to come forward this year and take a look at different things. and. They're motivated. Uh, they've been uh, addressed in some instances by this charter school movement, and I've been to some of the charter schools and sat in the classes with them like I do with the regular schools. There are very few of those, as you know. Um, they can, seem to come along one or two a year in different locations. Um, and then the school choice has a, has a number of different issues. Um, for example, just a simple geography of Mississippi, uh, you're not going to find somebody drive. DeSoto County has great schools, for example, and Clarksdale does not mm-hmm. currently. And so you're not going to see somebody, you know Clarksdale, you're not going to see somebody drive, uh, you know, an hour over to another school in the morning and then kind of try to get back to work. So there are, with school choice, um, there are geographical limitations to that kind of thing. And then the schools themselves may not, you know, they may want a, tw- a class of 24, and they already got 24 in the class, and so they're not going to accept them. So there, there, are a lot of, there are a lot of issues with that. Uh, uh, we've been trying to build that up that, but if you, if you threw out the marketplace, and I agree with you there, I mean, uh, uh, people who are in a particular area where school is already maxed out, they're not going to pass a school bond no, no, uh, no. for people. <laughs> to in, educate in somebody from an hour school, away. Yeah, to educate somebody else. I understand. So that's the marketplace taking care of itself. I mean, that's checks and balances there. Right. But in areas where it is suppressed, and rural areas also, if dollars were following the students, then maybe the private sector would come up, and we would have, you know, a private sector with all the civil rights availability is, uh, on, uh, on, uh, built into it. Uh, as far as the marketplace, if it's financially feasible, the private sector would uh, right, would and you're, you're seeing that with your charter schools, and there are some schools, well, Paul. That, that just a second, I want to talk about one particular. Sure. Delta Streets. Now, Delta Streets is not a charter school. And it is it, it is not a, a a part of that of that structure, but they're taking kids that would be um, at best uh, difficult and uh, running them. He runs a phenomenal program downtown uh, mm-hmm. Greenwood. I, I encourage you to go. I've gone there often to watch their expansion. They just finished their gym there, and they're they're basically doing what you said. They have taken this one man has made the decision that he's going to take some of the toughest of the tough and they're they're going to have an education and they graduate maybe 10 8 or 10 or 15 a year now and all of them are take, getting yep. jobs and whatnot and they're not in in any of this network they're not in in the charter schools or any of this other stuff so there there are people doing that kind of work out in mississippi and particularly in greenwood uh, moving on to tax uh, reform again to see if we take another bite out of that. What's what's your thought on that one in the 2024 session? Well, we talked about that yesterday. The uh, Doing the grocery tax, which I, I have uh, some leanings towards, um, um, it becomes more complicated because the legislature has appropriated some of that money out to the cities, and they think they would really be hurt if you if you cut the grocery tax. They believe that they would be hurt. And there's some formulas that have come up to try to make them whole and that kind of thing. So that's a little bit harder than just a straight number. Uh, On the income tax, um, we're set, you know, we're reducing it by three tenths, four tenths, Mm -hmm. three tenths to four in three years, the next three years. We've got a break coming up here, and uh, the computer's going to take us away. I'm going to ask a real elementary uh, question about that because I've never gotten the answer as far as the... uh, grocery tax when we come back to the lieutenant governor i'm sure he'll be able to answer that (laughs) (laughs) i don't know it's It's been a long few months that's that's a a loaded uh, (laughs) teaser there back with delbert husband lieutenant governor coming up next in 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 part of that half of it is from uh, the federal and half of it is from state yeah 18 cents i I think this yeah 18 18 and a half The, the same thing goes with um with the grocery tax some of it goes back to the municipalities, and some of it goes to the state. 
couldn't that part that goes to the state just be the part and and that will still keep the uh, the municipalities whole yeah I, I, oh. any any bill that comes out on the grocery tax is not going to shorten the amount that goes to the city so mm-hmm. that would that would be a um, an absolute barrier to, to adoption uh the cities really uh, the cities in the counties uh really run the state paul it's not run in jackson and you know i have a good working relationship with our boards of supervisors and our mayors and whatnot like that we did a main street program which we put uh, i think five million dollars this year to up, upgrade main street around small towns in mississippi and those need to prosper that those are places that kids will come home to uh there are places now that we're putting the internet in where you could work there or you know work in seattle or, or work in Sidon, and then you know it really won't matter so we're we're really uh, trying to upgrade, I think, and help our small town survive. And we wouldn't, you would never want to cut their their take of the of the grocery tax. So it's going to come out of the state uh, portion. Six six two says if the lieutenant governor wants to see how a rural hospital can be profitable, needs to visit Knoxville General Hospital. They are a country funded, or that should be county, I'm sure, county, county funny, uh, funded hospital steadily adding services and staying in the black. Yeah, they it can be done in Knoxville County. Yeah, it can and, be done and, in uh, they, they have and they have done one, mm-hmm. and there's two or three like that that are um, that have a positive uh, cash flow. <clears throat> most, uh, quite frankly, though, Paul, most of them do not. Yep. Uh, you know, yep. when I was in Brookhaven, we walked all of Brookhaven's about, you know, about a third of their rooms are closed because they can't get nurses and whatnot, but they're delivering babies and doing all the things you'd want to do at a small hospital. Mm-hmm. Uh, grocery tax would help more people, especially the people that are on uh, fixed income. SNAP pays no grocery tax, but lower income people, that doesn't have uh, that extra benefits, et cetera, et cetera. Mm-hmm. Well, I, I think everybody is thinking about it. As far as giving a tax refund, the best way would be on grocery taxes, especially now more than ever before. Yeah, we, we started yeah. that a couple of years ago. I floated that as, as a proposal, but I didn't get much back from the House on that position, and we ended up settling down on the income tax. So we've got a new House leader this year uh, that will be elected. Once he or she is elected over there, then we'll, we can start these kind of discussions and see what their appetite may be for the grocery tax or continuing to lower the income tax. Um. Open primary, people were talking about that during all of the yeah. heat of this election. I, I don't know how an open primary would work. It, to me, it's just looking at it, it's a little socialist, but you, you're putting everybody in there, lumping them in. And yeah. I mean, you could have two two Republicans, could you not? You, you do, and in Louisiana that happens. And uh, somebody asked me about that the other day, and um, I said, well, who's opposed to it? And I said, well, the Democrat Party and the Republican Party, but uh, other than that, it's fine. <laughs> <laughs> True. Oh, by the way, any comment on, and, is, and I think he's being scheduled on here, both of them, mm-hmm. Uh, and to me, it just makes me smile to see Rodney Hall, a, a, a legislative a legislator elect up in the uh, northern part of the state, I think DeSoto County, uh, African American gentleman. Mm-hmm. Did, did I get his name right? I, I don't know. I was following and, a, another race. And also, and also Thomas Tuggle, and, and Thomas, we know, of course, yeah, good uh, guy. first uh, a black sheriff in, in since 18 something. Uh, and also a Republican. So yeah, he's here a really we have two two Republicans uh, um, um, who have been. I mean, and I think I don't even think it was close. No, and I uh, Thomas Tuggle was down here forever and, and ran Malo- yes. ran the trooper school yes. and everything. Which I think is an outstanding person. I've known him probably twenty five years, and I, I think that's a great hire up there. I, uh, the other, I'm sure the other gentleman was good too, but I. I, I know Tuggle uh, personally, and I'm really excited about his about mm-hmm. his election there. You know, we we have a big tent like Haley trying to do all these years. We have a big tent, so we we have people. That, I mean, if you believe in working and 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 raising your family and, and educating children and uh, all those kind of and, and having your government run well, that that should not be any issue. But as to color, creed, national origin, or whatever. You know, we just we need yeah. to have our progress, and I, I think you know, obviously we're going to be controlled by Republicans, and that's our that's where our compass is, and my compass will be. But we we have room for others to join us, and we love to have people join us as Republicans, no matter where they came from. Any final thoughts, sir? Well, Paul, um, I'm glad the election is over. I'll tell you that, uh, and most everybody <laughs> I think is, uh, and we're sick of seeing those kinds of stuff. But I don't want to lose focus of the fact that we're in the best financial condition we have ever been in in the history of Mississippi. 
we have cash in the bank. We're paying off debt. We're educating our people with $2 billion in infrastructure. We are going to have the best four years Mississippi has ever had unless there's a recession at the national level, and we're prepared even for that. Governor, thank you, sir. Appreciate it very much. Oh, it's I, good I to see you again, Paul. Thank, thank you, you man. Call any time. And uh, got I saw Perez. He said to say hello. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Philip Shamley, Executive Director, Mississippi Petroleum Marketers Association. He will be in. But first of all, let's get an update from Fox News Network.